Hello! Welcome to Learning Philosophy via video. Online. It's a brave new world of education. If you're watching this, there's a good chance that uh, you're doing so because of the, uh, what you call it, coronavirus that's wreaking havoc across the world. There's other reasons you could be watching this as well. I may have just put it up online, or we may be doing trial runs, or maybe you just found this on an old tablet sometime decades from when I originally recorded it. Well, we really only have one topic left to talk about this semester, and that's what's called philosophy of religion. I'm going to trust you all know what religion is. I'm going to trust you've heard that word before. You have some sense of what it is. I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to define religion, although in coming lectures we will be engaged in trying to define different religious concepts and words. That's what we do in philosophy. But for the next month or so, I think I've got 12 lectures scheduled having to do with philosophy of religion. So, someday, years from now, when your grandchildren ask you, where were you when you learned so much about philosophy of religion? You can take them back to the scary days of March 2020, with something called the coronavirus all around us, scaring us. And if you say to me, Kovach, you're clearly just recording these lectures in your office, on an afternoon, I'll say, yeah, where else was I going to do it? I'm still on campus, as of right now anyways, it's Sunday, March 8th. So philosophy of religion, this is the, uh, this is the stuff I'm supposed to be an expert on. I'm into it. This is what I write my papers on, this is what I publish in, my dissertation, all that stuff that I uh, really uh, I'm deeply into as a, as a professional philosopher is the philosophy of religion and the first topic we're going to talk about is just what should be the relationship between philosophy and religious belief how should they go together or not go together and today I'm going to tell you there's basically four positions regarding the relation of philosophy and religious belief. Here they are. You might want to write these down. These are definitely the kinds of things I will ask on a quiz. I will definitely ask you, what are the four positions regarding the relationship between philosophy and religion? And I'll want you to write these things down. I don't have a board with me today. I could get one. I could get a board. We can move over to a board. You want me to move over to the board and put these things on the board? Okay, I'll do it. But first I'm going to tell you what the positions are. Here they are. Position number one was called positivism. The positivists believed that there were only two kinds of meaningful statements. Meaningful. Two kinds of meaningful statements. A meaningful statement can be true or false. And the positivists thought that there were these two kinds. We'll call the first kind logical truths. These include things like uh, 7 plus 3 equals 10. These include things like all cats are animals. The logical truth is just this. If you understand the words, you'll see that they have to be true. The second kind of meaningful statement, according to the logical positivists, were those statements where you could state what they called the uh, verification conditions. How would you verify the statement, verify whether it's true, using your five senses? So, the moon is made of cheese. That's a meaningful statement. If I want to find out if it's true, all I have to do is go to the moon, take up a chunk of it, and see if it tastes like cheese. Very simple. 
The total number of stars in the universe is an odd number. I can tell you how I would verify that. It would take a very long time, but all I have to do is count the stars in the universe and see whether or not the number I come to is divisible by two. If it's not, the statement was true. If it is, the statement was false, but either way, is it a meaningful statement? You better believe it. So what would the positivist think of a statement like, there is God? What do you think? How would you ever verify that? How would you ever use your five senses to find out whether or not there is God? Okay, I'm not going to talk about positivism very much, because there's no positivists left. They're gone. Philosophers have abandoned positivism. Hooray! One of the few great stunning defeats in the history of philosophy, the death of positivism. Why do you think that is? Why do you think there are no more positivists anymore? I'll tell you in a moment, after I tell you about the other three uh, uh, theories of philosophy and religious belief, I'll tell you why there's no more positivists. But I bet if you're a clever boy or girl, you could pause this video right now, get out a piece of paper, and in just a few sentences, you could tell me why there's no one who still believes that there's only two kinds of meaningful statements, logical truths and those statements where we can state how we would verify them using five senses. Okay, second position regarding philosophy and religious belief goes like this. Religious beliefs require evidence. Look how simple this second position is. Religious beliefs require evidence. Four words. You can memorize four words for the test. You're going to be able to memorize all of these for the tests. Third position. Some religious beliefs are reasonable even in the absence of evidence even in the absence of conclusive evidence. Okay, fourth position. And we're going to go back to our old friend Wittgenstein here. There's a Wittgensteinian take on the philosophy of religion. You better believe it. If you've liked this Wittgenstein stuff, if you've enjoyed thinking about language games, position number four might be the one for you. It goes like this. It is not the job of philosophers to say whether religious claims are true or false. It is only the philosopher's job to try to understand what religious claims mean. I'll say it again. Wittgensteinianism. It's not the job of philosophers to determine whether religious beliefs are true or false. It is simply the philosopher's job to understand what these religious claims mean what they amount to. In other words, religion, says the Wittgensteinian, is its own language game. Religious talk is one of the ways we try to say and do things within a social context. If you want to know more about Wittgensteinianism and philosophy of religion, what do you do? You sign up for my class called Philosophy of Religion. It's too much for our class to go into depth here. You want me to go into just a little bit of depth? I'll just go into a little bit of depth. Consider a Wittgensteinian philosopher of religion named D. Z. Phillips. Dewey was his first name. D. Z. Phillips. He liked to say things like this. The statement, God exists, is not a statement in the indicative mood. What does it mean? What does it mean, not a statement in the indicative mood? I'll tell you what it means. You ever studied Latin? Some of you have studied Latin. In Latin we have different moods that our language comes in. The most common one, the most ordinary one, is called indicative. The cat is on the mat. That's a statement in the indicative mood. It tells you how things are. Some penguins are happy. That's a statement in the indicative mood. Are there other moods? Of course there's other moods. Shut up! That's a statement in the imperative mood. It's not telling you how things are. And there's an interrogative mood. 
How are you? What time is it? When is campus going to reopen? What's up with the coronavirus? Those are statements in the interrogative mood. They're asking questions. Well, D.Z. Phillips says, God exists is not a statement in the indicative mood. It sure looks like it, doesn't it? It sure looks like it. If I say, cats exist, that's a statement in the indicative mood. I'm telling you some of the things are cats. So what mood is God exists in? according to D.Z. Phillips. Well, I'll tell you. Phillips thinks that it's a prayer. He's, he says, when do we say this? When do we say, I believe in one God? We say that when we go to church and recite the creed. So he says, says religion is its own language game. Philosophers shouldn't try to figure out whether the statement God exists is true or not. That would be to try to play the science language game in a game that's not science. That would be like when your parents say, I love you, you being like, let's find out if it's true or not. No, wrong language game. So, okay, again, what are the four positions? I'm not going to go to the board, not today. Uh, I'll send you an email with these four positions written out because I do want you to remember them. Position number one, positivism. According, this is, the, this is the longest one. This is the one you have to start committing to memory today. Or else when it comes time for the quiz and you're trying to cram, you'll find you're running out of time to learn what you need to learn about philosophy of religion. So positivism is the position that there are two kinds of meaningful statement. What are they? Logical truths. Statements whose conditions, statements you could tell me how you would verify them using five senses. And lo and behold, religious statements fall into neither of those categories. So what? What's that mean? It means religious statements are neither true nor false. They're meaningless. They're nonsensical. Asking whether God exists is like asking whether February is more dignified than the number eight. See, it doesn't make any sense. Why aren't there any positivists anymore? Have you figured it out? Well, to tell the story very simply, to really kind of maybe oversimplify, oh no, the reason there's no positivists anymore is consider the claim that there are only two kinds of meaningful statements logical truths and those that you can tell me how you would verify it. Now, now, that claim that there are only two kinds of meaningful statements, let me ask you, is that claim a logical truth? Is that claim one that you can verify using your five senses? I don't think so. I don't think so. This is why positivism's dead. This is why there are no more positivists in philosophy. You might find positivists at your local coffee house. The drunkard at the end of the bar might be a positivist, but I can guarantee you that if somebody's a positivist, they haven't studied the history of philosophy. Because it's like day one of grad school. Let me tell you why not to be a positivist. Okay, position number two, and this is the one we're going to be interested in today. Position number two. Religious beliefs require evidence. What's evidence? Some reason I should believe something. Position number three. We're going to talk about position number three next time. And I'm going to tie it up with someone you've heard of before, someone called Thomas Aquinas. Position number three. Some religious beliefs are reasonable even without evidence. Don't, don't try to figure out too much of what that means right now, because I'm, I'm going to dedicate a whole lecture to it. I would like to dedicate a whole lecture to it in front of you, with you in the room, so we can talk about it together. But, as of right now, we're going to have to find some other way to make do. Position number four, Wittgenstein. Wittgensteinianism. 
It's not the philosopher's job to say whether religious beliefs are true or false, reasonable or unreasonable, evidence, all that's irrelevant. The philosopher's job is to figure out what the religious language game is about. You with me so far? You with me so far? Just today and next time, we just have to think about some of these positions. <clears throat> so I've told you why you shouldn't be a positivist when it comes to religious belief. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. Almost everyone thinks positivism just doesn't work when it comes to religious belief. What about this second position? Religious belief requires evidence. And I asked you to read something for today. Oh, it was very short. I hope you found time to read it. I know you're very tired. You just came back from spring break. But if you read Clifford's Ethics of Belief, a little excerpt from it that I gave you, what was it, two and a half pages? You'll find there a famous sentence. It's right at the end. You should memorize this sentence. Whenever somebody says W.K. Clifford, and he was a 19th century thinker, whenever somebody says W.K. Clifford, you should remember his slogan. What was his slogan? It is wrong always, everywhere, for everyone to believe upon insufficient evidence. It's wrong to believe without sufficient evidence. What does he mean it's wrong? Oh, he means it's morally wrong. He means it's seriously bad. Seriously bad. Like, you're a bad person if you believe religious things. If you believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If you believe in the virgin birth. If you believe in the revelation of an angel to the prophet Muhammad of the Quran. If you believe in the parting of the Red Sea. If you believe in any of these things, says W.K. Clifford, you're bad. And you know what bumper sticker Clifford hated? He hated the bumper sticker I just saw yesterday morning that said, it's not what you believe that makes you a good or a bad person, it's how you treat others. Oh, sure. Sure, the second part's fine. We should uh, certainly, if you're putting out a cigarette in a baby's eye, that makes you a bad person. If you're gossiping, that makes you a bad person. But that first part, what you believe, doesn't make you good or bad. Clifford says, sure it does. Sure it does. You might consider this the founding moment a, a modern movement called, here's fancy philosophy language for you. You just got to deal with fancy philosophy language sometimes. Virtue epistemology. Virtue epistemology. You say, what is, come on, man, I'm just back from spring break and you're throwing fancy words at me? Like, virtue epistemology? Well, calm down. You've heard of epistemology. I've been using that word since the first day of class. I don't use it every class. I don't try to cause you more pain than I have to. But you remember what epistemology is. It's the study of knowledge. What does it mean to know something? Okay, what happens when you put that word virtue in front of it? Virtue epistemology. Well, you've heard the word